We would like to thank Lone Star Tracking for sponsoring our webinar this month and also for providing a free GPS tracker for one year to one lucky participant. Thank you again, Lone Star Tracking. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, we'll be getting started here in just a second. Um, oh, my name is Bill Casanza. I'm the Livestock Guardian Dog Specialist here at the AgriLife Center. Um, also with me this morning is Dr. Reed Redden. He's our Sheep and Goat Specialist and also our Interim Director at the Center. I want to thank Robert Pritz. He's our Program Director um, of Ag and Natural Resources. He helped us uh, get the Zoom meeting set up this morning, so thank you again for that, Robert. And um, oh, presenting this morning will be Dr. Do John Tomachek. He's our wildlife specialist and also assist assistant professor. Um, oh, before I turn it over to him, I would like to thank um, Thomas Remart. He uh, oh, works with Lone Star Tracking and he's our sponsor today. Um, they'll be giving away one uh, oh, Oyster GPS tracker service for a year uh, to one lucky participant today. So um, thank you Lone Star Tracking for sponsoring our event today. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Tomacek. Thank you, Bill. I, I appreciate that. Bill, just a quick check. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you good. Okay, perfect. Uh, again, everybody, I want to thank you for being here with us today. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Redden and Bill and Robert for inviting me to speak with you today about livestock guardian dogs. They said, my name is John Tomacek. I'm a wildlife specialist with Texas A&M. And I uh, want to talk to you just real briefly today about some findings we had from a case study we did with some livestock guardian dogs a handful of years ago, uh, as, as it really does help shed light on common questions that we get from producers and other folks interested in the use of dogs. So just to give you a brief introduction to how we handled this project and, and how it came about, we hear a lot of things about livestock guardian dogs, uh, true, false, uh, imagined, or otherwise, right? We all have things we like to believe and people would tell me what dogs are. Uh, but one of the biggest things I would hear from my colleagues in the wildlife world is that guardian dogs take the place of a large canid carnivore, meaning take the place of gray wolves. And in a world where gray wolves used to exist all throughout Texas and other parts of the Western US, uh, but they don't anymore. But the rest of the ecosystem is built for that large canid to be part of it. And so the idea is that you take a wolf that works for you. And ecologically, that makes sense, and that, that works out pretty well. But for us in Extension, we needed some hard and fast data to make some recommendations. And that kind of data just didn't always exist for guardian dogs, especially in our part of the world. So we wanted to ask ourselves the question about what dogs' effect was on the territoriality of some of these predators of concern for sheep and goat raisers, on their activity, and how close those dogs stayed to livestock throughout the course of the study, how far did they roam both in and off the property, and what did their behavior look like. So our brief questions that we had on this project in terms of dog behavior, we were curious about how well they respected fences and how they interacted with perimeter fences and how they established territories and, and worked within those and uh, the issue of livestock proximity. Do the dogs stay with the stock or do they not? We wanted to ask specific questions about coyote behavior in relation to guardian dogs, but we also expanded that to looking at the effects on a number of other wildlife of concern. Of course, we always think about coyotes in terms of sheep and goat raising, but there are a number of other carnivorous wild species out there that are sources of concern for us. So when we approached this project, we went a little bit high tech and we went a little bit low tech on this one. So we attached GPS transmitters to the livestock guardian dogs in this photo, you can see a couple of my graduate students attaching a, a tracking collar to this uh, particular dog. We also attached proximity sensors to a number of the sheep and goats in flocks on the property. Uh, and those sensors interacted with the collars that were on the dogs to tell us not only that they were near a livestock animal, but which animal they were near. So they logged individual uh, ID numbers. We also conducted camera and scat surveys on the property intensively over the course of uh, two or three years. And when I say intensively, I mean that my poor graduate students depicted here picked up every piece of carnivore scat deposited on that property uh, for the course of three years. So pretty intensive there. So we took a look at how well the livestock guardian dogs uh, stayed on property, their site fidelity, how the presence of, of feed and water sources influenced how much country they covered, 
and uh, how well they stayed with their charges, right? So they stay with the, the sheep and goats or do they not? And when they move, what do they do? So just to give you some, some insight into this and kind of what the data look like at a top level. So we conducted this in Menard County on the Martin Ranch, which is a property run by Texas A&M AgriLife Research for the purpose of sheep and goat research. The property is about 5,000 acres and, and split up into a number of pastures that you can see outlined here in yellow. And there are animals split amongst those pastures. So one of the nice things about this project is we have the opportunity to take this as a case study. So dogs were already present on the property. So we weren't coming into a situation where dogs were being introduced and we were seeing the effects. We're looking kind of at the system as it's currently functioning. And we knew it was working well for a bit of background before dogs were brought to this property. Uh, uh, lamb rates were pretty darn low down in the 20% category, 30%. And, and it's just not sustainable. And after the introduction of dogs, those uh, cropped up into the 100, 120% uh, lambing rate range. So had an opportunity to look at a situation that was working well. We knew how the dogs were trained. We knew where they came from. If you've uh, listened to other webinars about livestock guardian dog training and bonding and whatnot, these were all worked through in a similar fashion in terms of give us the best situation possible to evaluate what dogs can do. And so what you're gonna see on some of these maps, uh, the presence of the dogs looks like this. You'll see these are dots that are locations taken by these collars across the course of a couple of years. And the important thing to note here is that, uh, one, my graduate students decided to give all the dogs names and they, they viewed them as gentlemanly uh, English butlers taking care of their, their very important sheep and goats, which I thought was interesting, but they gave them all male names. I pointed out, you know, that dog over there is female. So this dog here is, is a female that they renamed Elizabeth because they viewed her as the queen. Fun, fun, but how did she behave? You're gonna notice that most of her points stayed within one particular pasture throughout the course of a year. And you can see some areas where the points are a little bit more dense than they are in other areas. And those for the most part are some uh, feed and water sources. But what I want you to notice here is that there are times that she moved and there's two distinct times that she left her pasture. Um, in those situations, it was when we had other animals that were lambing or kidding and she went to those areas during those times to be present for those events and provide a little bit of support and probably clean up some afterbirth as well. But for the most part, she stayed within those boundaries of the, the fence that her flock was in. The thing I want you to take away from this is we know the dogs are fully capable of traveling between pastures. No two ways about it. Those are standard net wire style fences. The dogs are not going under them. The dogs are going over them. They're very capable. Pyrenees dogs, Anatolians, those size dogs, climbing a regular livestock fence is not hard for them. So the dogs are able to move, but they don't and they don't go to pastures where there were not livestock. They are properly bonded, properly trained, and they are seeking to be with those animals. And you're gonna see there are some points on the far right-hand side of the map where animals were moved during one point in the study and the dogs kept up with them. So just to show you a couple more maps, this is uh, another dog, uh, similar behavior to the one you just looked at and tracked with her most of the time. Those two stayed together quite a lot. Uh, and we did not see them wander very far from one another at any given time. Of course they did, but they're still staying with, for the most part, the livestock that they're supposed to be attending. And you can see how the points stack up on different parts of the fences. They just really don't leave all that much. And you'll see here, there's one other dog that spent a fair amount of time also with those other two, but was a little more diffuse. He didn't stay with them all the time and he stayed with sheep, but he's still not crossing out of pastures that didn't have sheep in them. I wanna point out though, if you'll notice on the far right-hand side of the screen, there are some points off the property. We had a time when a, a fence was down or a gate was left open and the dogs did leave for a little while, but they didn't travel very far, so we had uh, a, pr a proximity fence in the GPS tracking software that told us when the dogs left the property and took high frequency data so we knew exactly how long they were gone. So what you're gonna see here is that in this case, yep, they were off property just a hair over a full day, 27 hours or 30 hours, respectively. So even though those animals tracked off property, they didn't go wild and go wandering away, they want 
to be with the livestock that they're attending. Now there's one other dog on the property that interestingly enough uh, did not stay much with the other three dogs. You're gonna notice an intense number of points here in a southern pasture and in the two western pastures and I wanna show by comparison what the other dogs looked like. So it's almost a flipped image. And the issue that's going on here is that that pasture was stocked primarily with goats. And this dog found an affinity for those goats and stayed with them. Now, your first criticism is gonna be, well, John, I see that there's a spot on the southwest corner where that dog left the pasture at a point. And we don't know for sure what happened in this instance. Uh, the dog did climb the fence and leave. However, in the course of the study, we didn't see coyotes very often on this property, but this is the location where we typically saw them. That dog was gone two times, one for 21 minutes and the other time for nine minutes. And I can show you his track. He left the property, made a quick loop, and in both cases came back. In the, the shorter case, that, which you'll see in red, he made a wide loop and came back almost to the spot he began. The uh, 21 minute departure, he was off property, not very far at all, right? This is a, a very small area. So those dogs are staying within the area that they've been assigned and they're staying with their livestock. And that really is, all fancy statistics aside, it is a keen takeaway for us with well-trained, well-bonded dogs. Now on the predator side of the equation, when we started this project, what we wanted to do was to capture some predators put tracking collars on them and release them to see what they do, which is not entirely popular with most folks in the area, and I understand that, but we wanted to see what the, the, the close interactions between coyotes and dogs would be. The problem we ran into is the dogs were so darn successful that very few coyotes were ever on the property. And so what you'll see here is what we ended up doing was putting up a number of cameras throughout the property. We had 44 game cameras monitoring the property as well as we mapped every section of road on the property because predators preferentially lay scat down on roadways to territory mark. And my poor graduate students walk every mile of road on this ranch at least once a month for a period of two or three years to collect all of it and see how many animals we had where just based on the presence of their scat. This is a way that we commonly in wildlife monitor carnivores along with that camera data. So again, when we get camera data from predators on the property, it'll be often things like this. You see the gray fox crossing here, or at the same location a little bit uh, different time, you'll see a bobcat crossing here. There's a lot of, of preferential use of the road. So on the property, all in all, we had a number of different carnivores we were dealing with. Coyotes, which we saw rarely, but we did see them. Bobcats, badgers, raccoons, ringtails, various skunks, and a lot of gray foxes, which doesn't surprise anybody from this part of the world. And I would point out to you that in this case, you may say, well, John ringtails aren't really much of a concern for us, but in terms of acceptability of guardian dogs as a technique, it's important for us to track what the effects on other wildlife are. So what we saw from our camera data is that for the most part, coyotes avoided those guardian dogs, uh, at least at the pasture level, right? So we were analyzing everything at the pasture level, what animals were where. Now I will also say we had very few uh, times when coyotes were on the property during the course of the study. And it's hard to say if that's because the dogs are there or because coyote numbers in that area just weren't all that high at that time. It's hard to say for sure. But what I can say is that we did not typically have coyotes around those dogs. What we saw is that gray fox really were not terribly affected by the dogs. They did not seem to care all that much. Uh, and I'll show you some results in a second that might actually indicate a different response, but I want to explain it and show it to you. We did see a little bit of an effect on the bobcats presence of the dogs uh, in the pasture. Uh, at a holistic level, we didn't see a lot of effect on deer and turkeys, but without intensive tracking of those animals, we were not working with survey methods that were designed to detect uh, deer and turkeys at a high level. So this is something that really does need some more work is what's the effect on game animals. So when you look at how many of uh, those carnivores we saw on the property during the course of the study, a few things won't surprise you. You don't see a lot of ringtails, you don't see a lot of badgers. They, they tend to keep to themselves. And, and fun fact, if you're ever curious, badgers don't deposit scat on roadways. Uh, they actually deposit scat in burrows underground. They don't leave it around, they're tidy, they put it underground. So it's hard to detect them, that's all camera-based data. 
a lot of gray fox, which don't surprise anybody, a lot of raccoons, which shouldn't surprise you, and a fair number of bobcats, not very many coyotes. But the thing that I want you to take away, this is a simple chart at a pasture level when we had dogs in the pastures versus when we didn't. So when the dog was present, what was the effect on the presence of certain species there? The black lines indicate a percent reduction in presence of those species when dogs are in the pasture. The blue lines indicate a percent increase of presence when the, the dogs are in the pastures. So pretty much everything avoided those pastures when the dogs were around. Uh, badgers, bobcats, raccoons, coyotes, you can see the bobcats were uh, significantly affected in a fair amount. Raccoons as well significantly affected in a fair amount. What's interesting is that gray fox were detected a little over 20% more than uh, they were when the dogs were not present. And why would that be? So it's an interesting thing in the canine world. Every single canid, wild canid, competes with one another. So for example, a lot of the behaviors of coyotes are designed to keep them safe from wolves. If a wolf finds a coyote in the wild, it'll kill it stone dead. But wolves don't care much about foxes. They're too small for them to really mess with. Coyotes, on the other hand, are intense predators of foxes. It's one of the reasons that gray foxes climb trees. They get away from coyotes. So it's interesting when we brought in dogs, it essentially released gray foxes from their, their fear of being present in the pastures with coyotes, if you'll forgive the human analogy. And, and this is a concept called landscape of fear that we're working on more and more in the wildlife world. And it usually relates to the behavior of species like deer and elk and moose when you have predators around. If a predator spends a lot of time in a piece of country, that, that animal says it's risky to be there. I don't care how good the food is, you can't make me go there. Uh, there may be a T-bone steak, but I'm gonna go eat at McDonald's instead. And so in this case, with the presence of dogs, gray foxes were a, a bit more active in those pastures, which is something to keep in mind for those that are worried about gray foxes. So we did a little bit of a side study, which I think folks might find interesting. So we were collecting all this scat anyway, and we had a fair number of bobcat scats. And so I had a, a young lady working for me at the time that was curious what the diet of bobcats was. And the reason this is important is coyotes scavenge quite a lot. Something can already be dead and coyotes will eat on it for many days, raccoons, the same thing. All of our predators for the most part, except for bobcats, they scavenge a little bit but they do not scavenge all that much. And so most of what you see in bobcat scat is from uh, a live prey that they've killed. And so I had a young lady that washed all those scats, pulled every single strand of hair out of them and put it under the microscope. And put it on the microscope, it looks similar to the image on your left. And you can tell every species of mammal apart based on what their hair looks like under a microscope. It's a fun fact and a fun trick for us. So when she did this, kind of unsurprisingly, what we saw is that there's a, a lot of action on jackrabbits, to a lesser extent cottontails, a lot of mice and rabbits uh, going on there. Some white-tailed deer, which we know bobcats do prey on. In the livestock world, we had a little bit of evidence of consumption of sheep, right? We had one instance where we found sheep hairs. Uh, more skunks than sheep, which I found interesting, right? Um, why, oh why would a skunk be that important? But Fair enough, bobcats eating what they do. And then some other assorted items. And so we're seeing here that for the most part, we're not having a lot of pressure from the bobcats on our livestock, which is nice. So in terms of those proximity sensors we put on the livestock, and here's a good photo of what one of those looks like. It's just a little collar that's put on that interacts with the trackers on the dogs. So we wanted to know what exactly those dogs do. And for the most part, what we saw is that dogs tend to stay pretty tightly with their flocks. Um, because the water and the feed are spread out pretty well across the property, they weren't traveling a whole lot and, and camping out on their own feed sites, they stay pretty tightly with those flocks. Uh, and not going into too much uh, in-depth showing of analyses and results right now, one thing that is important to bring away we saw, at least at a cursory level, that dogs had particular favorite livestock animals they spent time around. Now, they, they got to everybody. There wasn't a time when every animal wasn't within a fairly tight proximity to that dog, and they did tend to make tracks, but they do spend a disproportionate amount of time with a handful of animals that they become attached to. 
From a management standpoint, what's interesting about this, and I would remind people is, if you're gonna move a dog to a new flock, or you're going to uh, replace a bunch of animals, you're gonna sell off a bunch of animals, you might do that in stages so as the dog can transition to new animals that it already knows. Uh, we had one instance on this project where most of the stock were removed uh, for a, uh, some kind of management action and the dogs did not handle that very well. They, they started to wander the property a fair amount, in theory looking for their charges, right? They're doing their job so well that they wanna be with those animals. So we saw a little bit of dog to dog interaction. We do have two of those animals that spend a, a fair amount of time with one another. But for the most part, they're spread out among those livestock and working the livestock. And especially they're spending uh, a fair amount of time when kidding and lambing are occurring down on the ground. Uh, I had a student took a photo and I couldn't turn it up for today. But I think the best photo I've ever seen was uh, the dog that tended to stay with the goats. We had during the kidding event, the dog was laid down uh, with a group of nannies that were kidding, you know, in a big circle or big area around and just pleased his punch sitting out there keeping an eye on everybody. And, and it's one of those situations where you, you say this is what we want from the dogs, but it's often hard to see whether or not they're actually doing it without somebody out there keeping an eye all the time. So one thing that was pointed out to us is what do the dogs do in terms of daily activity cycles? And, and forgive the graph that's a little bit higgledy-piggledy, but what I wanted you to see is that the dogs are active throughout the course of a 24-hour day, but they tend to be most active when the livestock are. So you can see in this case, in a 24-hour day, starting at zero and ending at 24, the dogs for the most part are active throughout the, the daylight parts of the day when the livestock would be. Now, what you will also see here is that when we see peaks and valleys, right? So there's, there's a time of day that they're not very active when it gets a little bit warm. Uh, and then there are times a day that they're a fair amount more active. For the most part, they're active during the daytime. They bed down with the stock at night. One question that we've had, and, and uh, forgive the chart here, but it, it's, I'm gonna explain it to you a little bit. Question we had is what's the effect on the presence of food and water with what these dogs do and don't do? And, and it's a fair question. If you don't have enough water and food distributed, will the dogs camp out on it? And, and how far will they travel from those things? In areas where folks are running a lot larger country, you may have some different situations than we did. Our pastures, the average pasture is a little bit over 500 acres. And in those cases, we did not see a significant impact of the presence of water or food on where the dogs would and wouldn't go. They tend to cover most of the area that they're assigned to without trouble. We do see a disproportionate amount of time spent at water troughs and feed sites, uh, which makes sense, right? If I go back to my earlier maps, you'll see how dots are stacked up. But the thing that I would also point out to you is that most of our food sites are also at the same watering points that the livestock are watering at. So is it that the dogs are spending a disproportionate amount of time there or that naturally livestock spend a disproportionate amount of time at water troughs? Because on this property, there's not much free water, right? It's all troughs and windmills. And in that essence, the dogs are doing exactly what we want them to do. We've strategically placed their food at a spot that they're going to have to go anyway. The livestock are watering, they're watering, and that's a good situation to be. So we did not see the effect in this study of the dog's time spent disproportionately at food and water sites and not covering that full area. So this chart, in essence, all it says is that the further you get away from water or food or any of these things, the, the um, larger area those dogs are, are traveling, right? Or longer distance those dogs are traveling. So in essence, what we're seeing here is that for most ranges the dog could be moving at, they're not having a hard time covering that entire pasture. So we don't see a situation where you've got food at one corner of the pasture and we know the sheep are traveling that whole range, but the dogs never go to the back half. We don't see that at all. We see the dogs covering that area that they've been assigned to cover. So all in all, what we found from the study is that most of our, our predatory species of concern appear to have a shift in their behavior when dogs are present in the pasture, the dogs tend to stay with those livestock. They, they do have some movements away from them, right? We also see a couple of extra property movements where they left the property, but it's for a very short amount of time uh, and, and they always come back. We do not see them leaving the property even though 
They have points on the fences, on perimeter fences, and we know that they are fully capable of exiting the property at any given time. So we had a fairly positive result with this study. We have some unanswered questions still that we need to investigate a little bit further, but as far as an initial case study, it gave us a fair amount of reason to suspect that when properly trained and bonded, these dogs were able to do what it was that they were designed to do. So with that, um, I'm gonna just stay brief today and, and wrap up, and this is a photo again I, I point out. Uh, the dogs do a fairly good job of staying with the flocks and, and uh, keeping up with those animals. Anytime we would go out to find individual dogs and check on them, this is a typical scene that we would find, right? Uh, dogs with its charges, keeping an eye on everybody in right where it's supposed to be. Uh, and the nice thing is that the dogs get comfortable with you. They don't really bother too much if you're there or not. You know, I, the dog sees us, the dog doesn't really care all that much. And uh, if we need to go handle that dog, it's, no, no, I, I need to stay with the livestock, uh, doing the job that we asked it to do. So with that, I'll be brief today. And if y'all have questions, I would love to hear them. Uh, Bill, Robert Reed, if, if any of y'all, if there are questions getting typed in or however you want to handle that, uh, I would love if you'd help me keep up with them so I can make sure to answer them all. Um, Dr. Tomachek, one of the questions that came up was, um, how often did those GPS trackers um, report a, a position? That's a great question. So it, it's an interesting one too. Um, the study was supposed to track those dogs every hour of the day, once, once an hour, and, and that would preserve our battery for a long period of time. We actually have a set of about three months of very intense GPS data. There was a programming error and those collars were taking a position about every two minutes. Uh, so that, that's an interesting case study aside. So we had to replace batteries and, and go back out there. But for most of the study, it was every hour on the hour they would take a position. And I, I guess the, the caveat to that, Bill, is with the, the proximity fence that we programmed in the computer, if the dog has left the property, that's when you get that fine scale measurement where we can tell you they were gone for 21 minutes or nine minutes, that kind of thing. Okay, another question. Um, oh, can you talk about the effect of the dogs on uh, oh, big cats? I'm assuming like uh, oh, lions, cougars, that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, good question. So we, we have some anecdotal reports from folks working on the property that they had seen big cats before the study had started. But in our time there, we didn't detect either by locating scats or with cameras, uh, large cats on the property. So we were limited to bobcats as far as the felines that were present during this study. Um, somebody else was also, or that same person was also wondering, um, oh, what was the breed of the dogs at that point in time? So that, that's a great question. The dogs were out there before I came in, and, and what I would tell you is they, they tend to be, of, they seem to be of mixed background. Uh, Reed may be better to answer that than I am. Uh, I, I could see some Pyrenees influences in them. I could see some Anatolian influences in them. Uh, Reed, if you're on and, and handy, could you comment on that? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're right, John. There, there may be one or two that were out there that were of um, kind of more pure lines, but for the most part, they're kind of the Texas guard dog cross, which is mostly Great Pyrenees, Anatolian, maybe a little bit of Akbosh, Marima, other types of things. But um, we were not studying the effect of particular breeds. Um, another question, Dr. Tomachek, uh, have you found any relationship between the size of the property and how close the dogs stay with stock? So yeah, that, that's a great question. And that's one of those that in the future, we really need an opportunity to test because limited to just this property, we're only able to see the influences of the size of the property we're working with here. So from our point of view, we can see that the dogs were able to fully cover the pastures and, and cover the property without a lot of difficulty, but we have not worked in a situation that's much larger to see kind of what's the logical limit of that. You know, some of that uh, much bigger country out in West Texas where you, you can get a, an honest to goodness, very large pasture. Uh, next question, are there um, similar studies involving llamas, alpacas, donkeys, or and their effects on as guardians that you know of? 
Yeah, not, not structured in exactly the same way that we did. There are some studies out there that have asked those questions, but we have never, at least I've never approached it in this way. And what I always remind folks about this topic is, remember as a wildlife person, I'm looking at this as animal behavior. And canines, whether they are domestic dogs or whether they're wild, they have elements of their behavior that, that are different from your herb, uh, herbivorous animals, your, your animals like your donkeys, the llamas, alpacas, etc. cetera. And, and so remember, domestic dogs are bred from gray wolves. We bred them for specific traits and behaviors. And, and I am no expert in the world of dog breeding and, and dog behavior and training, but there are aspects of that wolf behavior that we take advantage of and, and that is something to bear in mind. We are trying to use a natural behavior that works very well on those other wild predators, at least in terms of, of canines, right? So when it comes to uh, herbivorous animals like donkeys and llamas, et cetera, that, that study might have to be structured a little bit differently just to capture differences in types of behavior. But, but again, we've never done that here in my group uh, with those animals. John, got a um, question. What was the furthest distance and what was a typical distance that dog traveled from the dogs traveled from livestock? Yeah, so that's a great question, Reed. We had some situations where the dogs, and again, this is in that time that the animals were removed, a large number of animals were removed from the property. We had a couple of dogs that traveled uh, three or four miles, you know, wandering, looking for stock. But generally speaking, those animals were never further than two, 300 yards from the furthest livestock animal. Of course, some of that has to do with diffusion of stock during the day as they're out foraging, right? So the dog can't be everywhere. So they're traveling between those animals and, and the effect of goats versus sheep has a lot to do with that. But as far as being away from stock, never very far. Um, again, common distance, 100 yards, 150 yards, that kind of thing. Um, nighttime distance is a lot closer typically. Yeah, and I'd just like to comment that, you know, those those animals are in a pinched range and they scatter out. Um, so, you know, 100 ewes might be in, what, five to 10 different groups wow. kind of scattered around. And then you had trackers on maybe 10% of the animals. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, you, you never knew exactly if they were away from livestock totally. They just might have been with livestock that didn't have a tracker on them because we didn't have tracker on all of them. So, right. Good point. And I wanted to follow up with that. Um, you, you had, uh, I'd seen some data from you on this. I don't think you went over it in this uh, presentation, but um, did you see that some dogs had an affinity for certain animals within the flock that they were always near them or did they kind of scatter and make the rounds of all the sheep within the flock? So it's a great question, Reed, and I touched on it just briefly, but didn't go into it. So we had each animal had a few, each dog had a few stock that they tended to spend a large amount of time with. And, and I, I question if it's the dog is attached to the stock or vice versa. And, and I'll explain why I, I want to know more about this and why I question it. So right as the study started, uh, and, and you may remember, Reed, we had a dog die on us. Uh, and again, it was, it was very upsetting for us, right? We just got started. We'd been going, I think, a month, maybe two months. And, and I had a, a graduate student call me. And uh, they said, Doc, uh, one of the dogs is dead. Of course, you know, I jump, my head goes through the ceiling. I was, what do you mean the dog's dead? You know, I'm thinking a grad student did something stupid. And, and they said, no, 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 we just, we got the mortality signal on the collar. So it was programmed if that animal quit moving for a period of time, it would send us a message, right? So they, they found the dog and it was just laid out in the pasture, dead. Uh, no, no adverse effects, no signs of any, you know, uh, Matt, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, foul play or anything like that. And so that dog, although it was dead, still had four or five ewes that were standing around, it, just standing around the carcass, not going anywhere. The rest of the flock had moved on and they stayed there. And so we removed that carcass, took it to town, had a necropsy done by the veterinarian to make sure there was nothing, you know, untoward that we needed to document. And when we returned to the property, those ewes were still standing where the dog had been. And I questioned to what extent the dog was attached to those ewes or the ewes were attached to that particular dog and wanted to stay with it for some reason. 
So later in the day, we were at a bit of a, a loss as to what to do. And later in the day, we had another dog come by with a group of sheep and that those use essentially buddied up with that group and moved on. So we do see some of this affinity and the problem of, of our tracking data is I can't tell you who's more attached to who, right? But I, I think we do see it and it's something that we need to know a little bit more about. Um, oh, another question that came in on Facebook here. Are there any livestock guardian dogs on adjoining property? And if so, uh, was there interaction between um, our dogs and those dogs? At, at the time of this study, there were no other livestock guardian dogs on adjoining properties. And I can't speak about it since then, but at this time, no. Um, there are now, for those people that are, are curious on um, oh, one side of the property, there are some dogs and uh, there is some interaction between them once in a while. There's also a question if there were hair sheep or wool sheep. And um, if I'm not mistaken, there was uh, both at the time. Yep. Yep. Um, another question, Dr. Tomacek, uh, do the dogs have an influence on hog populations? So that's a great question that, that right now I am trying to design a study to ask more questions about. And, and the thing I'll tell you is on this property, we do occasionally see feral hogs and at times they're, they're pretty bad. We never saw in the course of our surveys, we never detected pigs and, and most of the sign that we would see on the property uh, is on the far eastern side of the property where the dogs really weren't most of the time. And so I've got anecdotal evidence from folks that dogs do a good job of keeping pigs away, but we haven't ever tested that uh, in, in the course of a study like this, although I would very much like to. Um, another question that came up, and I guess I'll just kind of address this one real quick and read, or Dr. Tomachek, if you guys want to jump in. Um, somebody asked about some information on training um, livestock guardian dog puppies to sheep. Um, oh, I do have a little fact sheet, and um, oh, I could send that to you. And if you follow our Facebook page, there's a lot of information that we put up um, on the bonding project that we currently have going on. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, please shoot me an email and I can give you some more information on, on that bonding project and what we have going on. And, that, and I'm, I'm going to say from my perspective, you know, I'm a wildlifer. I'm not an animal scientist and, and I'm not a, an animal uh, breeder, but I have witnessed the effects of folks really working hard to train and bond those dogs. And, and from my kind of outside perspective, it makes a tremendous amount of difference. I think the best analogy that I ever heard was, you know, the dogs are bred to do this. It's in their genes. However, just in the same way, you would not go take uh, an unbroken colt and throw a saddle on it and expect to go rope in a rodeo this afternoon. You are not going to throw a dog out there that's not had any training and expect it to be able to perform at a high level. So dogs got the, the ability to do it, but working with them in the way that, that Bill and Dr. Redden have uh, in terms of bonding and training, I can't say enough about that from my perspective in terms of the dog's effectiveness. Uh, another question, does the study show that activity of dogs influenced by, um, or I guess are the dogs activity influenced by stock or predators? I'm, 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 I apologize, I'm not completely understanding the question. So are you asking, is the dog, uh, behavior influenced more by the stock or the predators is that yeah that's the question gotcha yeah so from the activity we saw it it appears as though the dog's behavior and when the dog is active and not is more influenced by the typical behavior of sheep or goats when they're active how far they move kind of like reed mentioned you know they're spread out in small groups foraging and we don't see these kind of uh forays or, or long movements or, or, you know, guarding patterns that you might think of a dog that's sitting around a flock and running out and chasing something. But the problem is on the property, there are probably those short-term interactions that we just can't see, uh, but we don't see dogs essentially running a perimeter. We see them mostly staying with stock somewhere sometime. And, and again, you know, every breed's a little bit different, every dog's a little bit different, but from my perspective, these dogs, in essence, created a roaming territory that was their livestock, and their presence with the stock created this, this area that animals don't want to be around, right? If you're a smart predator, you start to equate sheep with a dog that's, that's big and imposing. If you're a 20-pound coyote or if you're a 25-pound bobcat, 
that's just a bad, it's bad math when you're dealing with a hundred pound Pyrenees dog. So what we typically see, at least what our data can show is that the dogs are mostly following the behavior patterns of the livestock. Yeah, John, and I would like to add to that, that as um, our program has been trying to find more over the counter GPS trackers, we've been working with a number of producers kind of all over this region of the state and um, almost every time we're shocked that the dog's movement patterns really reflect the animals. Um, whereas the general consensus within the livestock guard dog community is the dogs work at night. Um, and the data does not present that. However, most everything we're doing is on larger scales, you know, big pastures. Whereas if you had a smaller pasture and they didn't have to roam as much during the day, they might feel compelled to do that at night. But, right. So, so to that point, uh, Reed, what I like, I'm just going to flip back a few slides. Uh, da, 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 there we go. That one there is, is exactly what you're talking about, right? Dogs don't work at night. It's true they get up and move around a little bit, but most of their movements during the day and at night they bed down with the livestock. Or they may be barking at night, but they're not moving. And so people hear them barking and perceive that they're off in the distance doing something. And they may exactly. not. But again, we don't know that for sure yet. We haven't put bark collars or trackers on the dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Point. No, it's a good point, though. It's a good point. Right, so we, we did not see, and, and we, we really did think, right, from the guard dog literature, we expected to see, yeah, they're active during the day, but, you know, it's Texas and it's hot and they're, they're lazy. And then at night, boy, they're going to come alive and run all over the place. And, and we're just not seeing that. And this was all at the Martin Ranch in Menard, correct, Dr. Tomchek? That's correct, sir. And, um, oh, we are recording this uh, webinar, so it'll be on our YouTube page uh, oh, in a few days for those that are asking. And then another question was, um, oh, are the adjoining ranches all sheep and goat producers? Or are there other livestock that were on the uh, oh, perimeter, outside the perimeter fences of our ranch? Yeah, so at the time, and, and again, uh, Bill, Reed, y'all can speak to what's happened since then, but at the time, it was a mix, right? There were some folks that were still raising sheep and goats. There were some folks that were running cattle. Uh, and, and so it's not just sheep and goat country out there, but it makes it a little bit of everything. Yeah, it's still that way right now. So uh, another question that came up, um, oh, was the ranch in a predator control program? Um, oh, at this time or prior to the um, presence of the dogs on the ranch? Yeah, so they, there had been efforts at predator control before the dogs were brought onto the property, but in the time that we were working there, there were no other active predator management tools being used on the property. Okay, one uh, last question I see here. Um, Oh, it's a question about how the dogs um, oh, fare when they're being moved um, from pasture to pasture with the stock and um, oh, does it take some time for them to, um, oh, I guess get reacquainted, you know, when they've been moved to a new pasture? Um, are they, is there any time when they're more or less effective after the move? So I, I think what's interesting and, and read, Bill, feel free to chime in based on y'all's experience, but in the course of this study, we could tell pretty well when, when the stock were moved, but again, the dogs move with the stock, uh, just like when we needed to handle dogs, we tried to do it during times that those stock were being gathered and penned up anyway. And so the dogs stay pretty tightly with them. Uh, they don't seem to mind all that much. And I would remind folks that the dogs are fully capable of traveling over those fences and, and when they need to, they don't hesitate to do so. So it, it really did seem in this instance like the dogs were very well bonded to their livestock. Uh, and so as long as they're with the stock, they're really not too perturbed. Uh, as far as handling the dogs to attach those collars, pull collars off, you know, vaccinate, those kind of things, if you're just out in the pasture, that was a little bit more difficult than, than other times. But if you were in the pens surrounded by the stock, the dogs were very calm, easy to walk up to, easy to handle, and again, that that affinity for their stock. They're not being singled out. They're with that group that they're supposed to be with and they appear to be uh, quite content with that. Does anybody else have any other questions?
I just have one more comment. Uh, you had touched on this before, Bill, on, on resources. People can definitely reach out to us and follow um, our social media pages. But I'd also encourage people, if they're interested in what we've all got going on and what we've published, is go to our website, sanangelo.tamu.edu. And on the front page, there'll be a picture of a guard dog. Just click on that picture and it'll take you to all the resources um, that we have published and publicly available. Um, it's got an introductory to livestock guardian dogs that Dr. Tomachek and I and Dr. Walker put together. Bill's got a number of things on there. Um, we've got case studies and uh, I believe link to our YouTube channel. Um, that's also got videos, which this will be recorded and, and uploaded to the YouTube, YouTube channel and, and sent out by email to everyone who registered on Zoom. Um, so just uh, lots of ways to find out information. I want to make sure you're all aware of our website. Yeah, please check that out if you guys are interested in information. Um, oh, and if you're looking for sheep and goat information, Reed has an excellent site. He does a monthly blog. I do a monthly blog. Um, so I would encourage you guys to sign up for those things. There's a lot of good information out there. Um, oh, again, the research ranch for those who are asking is in Menard County that we did this with. Um, oh, are there any other questions before we, we wrap it up? Um, okay, well, I would like to thank our sponsor again, um, Lone Star Tracking for today. Um, our lucky winner of the uh, GPS tracker for a year is Miss Pam Watkins. Um, so Pam, if you uh, all would like to message me or I'll get in touch with you on uh, how to collect your uh, GPS tracker for a year from Lone Star Tracking. Um, oh, I'd like to th thank again Dr. Tomachek for joining us today, Dr. Redden for putting in his time, and uh, Robert Pritz for helping us get the webinar up and going. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone.